everyone, my name is Luna and I'm here to catch you up on everything that happened in episode 60 of Critical Role. And share unhinged sheepdog theories. Bordor, we know your secret. Just wait. The episode begins with the group deciding the best way to travel along and Prism says she can help them transport anything they need to carry, including the group using a floating disc with just one catch. That's kind of the curse of the disc is I can't get on it. Oh. Everyone else can, but I can't. That's so cool. I, I felt know. like you should have led with that information. Mm -hmm. Well, I can run sort of like the horse for the cart, and then it trails behind me. Ooh. But ever, I mean, it's kind of the story of a wizard, right? My magic is all effort. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I love that little dig about wizards having to work to like learn their magic rather than sorcerers just being born with it. Maybe it's after Aram finds Denise's missing pointer fingernail, very important. Can't find it anywhere. If anyone can find it, let me know. I need it. It's my pointer finger. It's important. Can Orm I do an investigation? <laughs> yeah. We can both make investigation or perception checks. Fuck it, I'm amused. Can I, I'll, I'll assist. Natural 20 for a total of 31. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck on the side of your shoe. Oh, <laughs> it happens. Very embellished shoe. Thank you. They set off towards a nearby town on foot. As they walk, Prism offers to find a copy of the scry spell in town that she can take a sneaky look at in order to learn the spell, confessing that she has stolen spells in the past from the restriction section of the Cobalt Soul. I really want to know what those spells are. If she has access to the scry spell, then they'll be able to use the objects that they have of their friends, like the things that Chetney made, to see what they're up to. And I'm intrigued to see if that will happen and when in Team Wild's Mount Journey they will cast scry. Hopefully not that that evening in the Savalier Wood. <laughs> Run, Jenny's gone crazy in the safe word is Parmesan. Aram asks if she knows the teleport spell, but unfortunately she doesn't have that kind of ability. She also clarifies that she's not a wizard. She's just an apprentice, holding the longest apprenticeship so far with the Cobalt Soul in Iman. I'm very keen to know more about this, but you know, it could just be related to the fact that she like steals spells and has immediately given up on her desire to fill in this survey. And she seems very keen for mischievous behavior at any opportunity. I'm willing to do dirty stuff. <laughs> They come to a fork in the road with some wooden signs. One points to Andovar and another points to both Halfdel and Othansia. Othansia is a country in Isilra whose capital city is Vasselheim, a place that we've seen before in Campaign 1 and it's said to be the first city of Exandria. It's the only one that survived the Calamity, it's been around for a super long time and it's like basically a major hub for uh, faith and religious temples and such. As they learn from Danios, this road is called the Outer Walk and as they walk along it they find some gallows at a crossroads. Lordna and Prism send Pate and Mother to have a look. Follow the raven. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your vote of confidence, but good call. I know you. I yeah, yeah, yeah. made you. <laughs> You did, you can unmake me, oh, I've heard it before. Amongst the trees behind the gallows, there are unmarked graves for all the people who have been hung here by the Valley Coalition. I don't think this phrase gets explained, but I'm just gonna take a wild guess that it's like the law enforcement in this region. Aram notices that a lot of the earth where these gravestones are looks disturbed, and Pate does some little dances on the grave to see if anything will come out, but nothing happens. They still decide though to give it a wide berth to avoid any potential zombies, and Matt sadly thinks of the cool gallows map he had planned, and. Just gonna put that one away. As the sun sets and the apogee solstice continues above, the three magic users, Lordna, Bordor, and Prism, feel a change in the taste of the air. Like, like there's a current, <laughs> like an electrical current that just very faintly drifts through the moisture that rests above. Um, Why do I taste batteries? I think we're in a blood mist. <sighs> you. What's a blood mist? Recall. The last time you sent something like this was upon your approach to the excavation in the Hellcatch Valley. The rising amount of general arcana energy that suffuses the space around a ley line nexus. The town they are approaching seems to be built on this ley line nexus. Prism casts a little minor illusion spell and it is more substantial than usual due to this thrumming of arcane energy and she warns the others not to believe everything they see. Lordna wonders if there might be Ruby Vanguard folks here since we heard from Keyleth that there were efforts on other continents related to Ludnus's solstice plans. The group walk through the village, which appears to be quite small, only around a thousand people, and they attract the attention of some of the villagers who eye them quite warily. Bordor takes the lead to talk to someone, saying he has faith in folks like these. He approaches an old man smoking a pipe. Excuse me, uncle. Hello, sir. I don't think I'm anyone's uncle, but... Uh... <laughs> just a, just a, a term of endearment, respect. I appreciate your respect. Why, but what? Whoa, um, where are you do? Who are you? What are you looking for? That story is very long, sir. Um, my um, um, friends, they're my friends. My um, compatriots and I, we, we're lost, actually. Do you know how I can get back to the 
Serious Mountains? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I've ever heard about no serious mountains. No. This man is called Hender, and Prism asks if everything's been okay in the town since the Apogee Solstice just started, but Emily rolls very poorly, and he says, nope, nothing weird going on here. At this point, a guard comes over and asks their business. He directs them to the Telda Twins pub where they can hire some rooms. Ashton then buys some tobacco off the man, and then he warms up to them a little, saying that they lost a few during the solstice and that they should talk to Prolef, a herbalist, or the elder Aberdeener if they want more information. As they move through the village, they notice a large, pristine temple, which seems at odds with the more humble surroundings of the rest of the village, and the general mood of the town is kind of hushed, with people talking quietly and the presence of the religious law enforcement sort of hinting at a general culture of this region of Isoro, which is so close to Vasselheim. They arrive at Innovar Apothecary, run by Prolef, a human man in his late 50s with thick brown hair, pulled into a ponytail, sort of wearing a leather apron, they inform him that they got magically teleported here and he expresses relief that the people who vanished from this town might still be okay. He says that they lost 11 people who vanished last night from outside in the stone square while the village held an impromptu celebration of the celestial event. They all heard Ludinus' speech. It's actually very interesting that people in this town heard the speech when, if I recall correctly, no one in Uthodurn mentioned having heard it, including Deanna and Frida. Laudna has a theory about this that she shares later in the episode. So we're under one of these nexus points. Mm. You were at a nexus point. Spitball, it's Right? Cold. I'm yeah. just spitballing here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You looked up and you also saw weird things yes. in the sky. Did you see the weird lights on the mountain before you were bamfed? Did I see weird lights on the mountain before I was bamfed? Yeah, he's on. I did. So what if, because then we were also right oh. at one of these points. Yes, right. What if the people yes. who got all, all Fuck. the people jiggery nice. pokeried, right, were the people who were close to the next yeah, but what Do you have any theories about this? Let me know in the comments. I personally think that Laudna's theory is, seems pretty legit. Hender also says that the temples of Vasselheim knew that the solstice was coming and they sent people to keep an eye on things because of the village's close proximity to the ley lines. We know that Vasselheim was obviously worried about something that was going to happen and maybe they thought there were going to be Ruby Vanguard people here as well. He gets somewhat nervous talking about this but shares... Look, there's been a lot of Offensian agents that have been coming down here. They sent one of their... One of those, um, what are they called? Judicator? The masked ones. Oh, shit. He tells him that the temple was built recently, about, well, it's about 20 years ago, not that recent, um, but after an influential family in the town, the Silvercore family, who runs one of the lumber mills, bought a block of land. This family seems to have a lot of ties to the temples, and before the village knew it, the temple was built up. He describes the temple's presence as being ever-present, and that it's hard to speak freely since the presence of all these guards is somewhat oppressive. Now, Bordor says something very interesting here. Amazing town. You have more than enough food, crops. Your livestock is beautiful. Your livestock are beautiful, huh? Like they would be beautiful to a sheepdog? Okay, it's unhinged theory time. <laughs> I gotta talk about the most popular critter theory out there right now, which is that Bordor isn't just some small town farmer or half elf shepherd, that he is a polymorphed or, or somehow transformed sheepdog, which is why he doesn't know how to use his magic and he sort of has the demeanor and attitude that he has. I think everyone latched onto this theory because of his name, Bordor Dogson, you know, Border Collie. Dogson, Dash Hound, I don't know. There might be something there. But not only that, he does seem to keep offering random information about being a shepherd or a dog trader, just at odd times. Your name was again? Ah, uh, Bordor, Bordor Dog Son. Bordor Dog Not the son of an actual dog, dog trainer. I'm gonna confess, when this theory first started circulating, I was not on board. I was like, no, I'm sorry, that's entirely too silly. But after watching this episode, I am changing my mind. There were other instances of him sort of acting a little strangely. Like first he had no drama about approaching people. He was like very happy to just go up and chat to anybody. He keeps offering everybody jerky specifically. Like it's very specific that he's offering jerky. It's the only thing that he has on him. There was also this moment later in the episode with Elder Aberdeena where he just starts rubbing her back randomly and she's like, uh, excuse me? I, I come up behind her and gently rub on her back. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the way a dog sort of like would crawl into your lap when you're feeling stressed or like rub up against you. And there's also a moment where he specifically asks Matt what the temperament of the livestock- What's their temperament of the animals? Uh, fairly relaxed. Like they're, they finish their day of work and they're starting to like chew and eat. Okay, that's a good idea. Guys, the oxen are pretty chill. I think it's okay. All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Each group. Yeah. Of like, it just makes sense. There are just too many clues now. I, 
I'm losing my mind about this. I have never, like, I don't think I have ever in the history of Campaign 3 ever wanted a theory to be true as much as I want this to be true. <laughs> what do you think of this unhinged theory? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here is another potentially more sensible theory going around that Bordor's newfound powers were gifted by a god since he is a divine soul sorcerer and such sorcerers have magic that comes from a divine source that glimmers within the soul. Perhaps the gods are out and about granting a lot of folks divine powers to try and help in the upcoming fight. You know, maybe Bordor is going to get a message from whichever god blessed him with this power around the same time that Deanna and FCG received messages. That was probably, I think, like a week into their time in Wildemount. So it could be that in like a week's time here in Ilsora, Bordor will get a similar message. Or maybe it's a combination of these two things. He's a divine soul polymorphed dog. I don't know. <laughs> After successfully making your way through the dark forest, sneaking past a pack of vicious wolves and squeezing your way under the garden gate, you've arrived at your destination. What would you like to do next? Well, I want to sneakily try and make my way over to the carrot patch so that I can steal a carrot. <laughs> okay, go ahead and roll a stealth check for me. Okay. <laughs> That's a natural one. <laughs> okay, well, as you uh, oh, no. sort of sneak your way along, or you think you're being sneaky, along the garden path, you come around the side past the windmill shed, you accidentally knock over one of these wheelbarrows here, and all of these uh, vegetables and produce go tumbling out with a clatter. You turn and see the farmer angrily coming towards you. Okay, I'm gonna start like flapping my wings really loudly and aggressively and just like look as scary as I can. Okay, go ahead and make an intimidation check. And you know what? I'll give you advantage because geese are naturally terrifying. No matter what game you're playing, whether it's a vegetable garden, goose adventure, an epic quest into the depths of hell, or an underwater escape from an ocean monster, Chepeku has the perfect map for your encounters and combats. Whether you're playing in person or online, Chepeku has got you covered with high quality digital files and VTT integration with Roll20, Alchemy RPG, Encounter Plus, Foundry, Fantasy Grounds, and more. Subscribe to their Patreon for as little as $5 per week using the link in the description to get a new map every single week, plus all previous maps Chepeku have released. That is around 4,000 maps. Okay. All right, I got an 18, is that enough? As the farmer starts coming towards you, you start sort of flapping your wings aggressively and ferociously as you advance, and you see he gets this worried look on his face. Before the temple was built here, the village tended to work more with the natural spirits of the landscape, and Elder Aberdeen is the person who communicates with them. Apparently they have been unhappy of late with the silver coal mill taking more from the forest than what was agreed. Prolef directs them to the knot burrow, which is the cottage where the Elder resides. They buy some healing salves, which act as healing potions, and Bordor trades an extra strength laxative for a favor to Prolef. Takes them and pours them that. all into one vial oh and kind God. of like corks it. That would be a pretty heavy laxative. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. All right, put that. Just wait. That's uh, six gold for the six. Oh gosh, you know what? I was gonna say I can't wait to see what happens with that, but I absolutely can wait. I don't know if I want to see that. Denise gives Prolef some of her handmade hair gel, and they head off towards the cottage, which looks like a classic nature witch's cottage. Honestly, I want to live there. After knocking on the door, they meet Elba Aberdina, who is a half giant woman with long gray hair and faded tattoos. Aurum Druid crafts a flower and gives it to her, and she invites them inside. They explain what happened, and she describes the event as being tangled ley lines. They kind of word vomit a bunch of stuff at her, especially Prism. And I'm looking for a scry spell hmm. that I could copy down. I'm willing to do dirty stuff. <laughs> Wait, no, I meant like thieving. <laughs> She's got a high price tag, though. <laughs> I mean, I'm I mean, going like, to ignore that insight roll. Ab Abedina's <laughs> brow curls up. Uh, I meant like things that I would get yelled at. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> not paying any attention not to her. Better. She's 12. <laughs> We just and Aberdeena tells them that they shouldn't be talking so much about these dangerous things sort of out in the open. She officially introduces herself as Elder Joan Aberdeena, a soothsayer and protector of this village. Aberdeena then asks for their opinion about the prime deities. I'm not a very religious man. There's too many examples in Exandria of abuse, of power, of all kinds of government, certainly of faith. And we notice the presence here in town. The truth is, not all of us, but some of us we're kind of at the kickoff of whatever this is, halfway around the world. There's forces out there that just as soon pull the gods down, and I think the problems I'm seeing here 
in your home are a response, an overreach. She asks Aram if she may, and with his consent, she releases some spores of some kind which allow her to experience some of what has happened to Aram to confirm his story. This is a bit of a callback, but maybe this spore-like substance is related to the drug that the All Minds Burn were taking back in Bassarus that allowed them to be kind of like a hive mind. She shares that she would like to see a new future, where there is a void of power from the gods so that something new can be built, that people can kind of come out from this oppression that they've been experiencing at the hands of not necessarily the gods, but the people who say they work, you know, for the gods, like the temples. She seems to be somewhat on board with Ludinus's plan, although she acknowledges that his methods are not ideal. Then she proposes a bargain. She will help them with finding their friends and getting back to them if they will help her with freeing her family, freeing the people of this village. She invites them to a meeting where they will learn more about what they'll need to do, Denise asks for some proof that she can help, and she shows a room inside the house that has a scry bowl, saying that she has used to scry on three of the people who have gone missing. One of them was adrift in the ocean, the ten-year-old is in a swamp, <laughs> and a farmhand is in the snow on the northern edges of Wildmount. Prism, who gets a good vibe, aka Emily gets a good inside check, uh, they agree to this deal, and the group split up to try and head to the meeting in a more discreet way. They all meet up at the Fairfroth Brewery, and as they arrive, they pick up the vibe of frustration and anger from the folks assembled here. Elder Aberdeen steps up to begin the proceedings, and as she begins, she rallies the people to rise up against the forces of Vasselheim to use the chaos of the solstice to take this chance to drive them out of the village with the help of the natural spirits, the Isladons. Either we fall with pride, or we take back this hill. We take back this valley. And perhaps, if we are not alone, we take back this world. And we will all be free once more. You see heads nodding throughout the chamber. Some whispers, some mutters. She gives leave for anyone who doesn't want to take part to leave, and some families do depart, while others step forward pledging to help, including Team AOL. The plan is to take on the temple, which has about six armoured bastions or guards, uh, three that are on the other side of the village, and the head of the temple itself, the Flame Guide Kiro. Flame Guide is a title of an elevated priest of the Dawn Father who is also like the head of a missionary. There are also two judicators somewhere in the village. Baldor suggests that he can go with some beer and tobacco to distract the guards, and Aram also suggests that they use the information they have to try and get an audience with the Flame Guide. Once they have an audience, they can attempt to persuade the Flame Guide and these forces that they should be in Marquette, like that's where the stuff's happening, and that there's no point in them being in this like little village. And then if that doesn't work, they'll say the code word, which was never really established what it would be, but I think it should have been Jenga! The group splits up with Border and Aurum teaming up to approach the temple, which is called the Sunrise Sanctuary. The guards immediately pull their crossbows suspicious and question them, and Border says they have some gifts, offering them a smoke and a beer, a beer which he pours the laxative into. It is uh, very much appreciated to come bearing gifts for the great and uh, majestic Dawn Father. Looks down upon us here in these strange times. Uh, drink to your health to another day of the sunrise to bring life to the crops, heat to the world, and justice to those who fall to the unjust. We all need a little light in the dark. Thank the Dawn Father. Mm. Thank you, Dawn Father. <laughs> Aram explains that he has information that would be useful for the Flame Guide and that he wants to help protect the interests of the temple. One of the guard goes in to get the Flame Guide and as they wait, Aram notices some of the trees around the forest seem to grow and push against it and also sees the two village groups sneaking forward. In that group is Prism, who sends Mother to look in the temple to get ready to cast a spell, rolling a stealth check. Two, so you just roll with advantage and then add 12. Oh my goodness, that's a crit. That's two crits again! Whoa. Whoa. Big money. <laughs> oh my god, wow. I play the lottery tonight. <laughs> please always Dang. Go. I should go to Vegas no. and shoot. Seriously, no joke. I Get a red eye after this. It's normal. <laughs> Bring in your loaded dice. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh. Mother stealthily flies into the temple and arrives at the main worship chamber, alighting out of sight, and she can see that there are figures researching in books and papers, as well as a judicator. The lightkeeper comes out and is not very impressed, but Aura makes a pretty good elevator pitch, packed up by Lordner, who casts Silent Image to make a sign of the sun above Aura, and Border casts Enhance Ability to give him advantage. This is why we do this. I got Katha and Rudis. Oh god. Oh. Katha, you better show up, bitch. 
They're both 10. What? Uh, what? That's a saying. What? what? Together becomes 20. No, persuasion is a plus five. It's 15. Oh, come on. Where are those two nat 20s when we need them? Unsurprisingly, the lightkeeper is not impressed and says that they will be taken to Vasselheim to speak to superiors there. And the guards go to take Orem and Bordor, but with a resigned sigh. I draw. Press the hilt to this man's hand and cast a vine on it and I leap 30 feet away and yank as hard as I can to throw him into the tower wall. <laughs> Slams into the side of the stone temple wall. You hear a heavy crack in his shoulders. He hits the ground, legs up in the air. Oh. And then I point the blade at Kiros, is her name? We have to figure this out now. She's like partway, like walks something in the ladder and goes, Lock it down! Prism uses her manifest mind ability, which is when she manifests her like spell book next to Arm and then dimension doors inside with Denise. Ashton runs full speed around the side of the temple and Laudner moves around the front as well, casting mirror image. Bordor turns to the guard. So I turn, I grab him by the shoulders and I go, this is escalating. I know you don't want to be here. You're going to die. Join us. I know you're not one mm, of them. Mm. Make an intimidation or a persuasion check. Come Your choice. Come on, Bordor. Oh, Fucking so close. 16. 16, he goes, Ugh! and just pushes off you and begins to run towards the temple where ah, the fuck. like the partially ajar, ajar door to the front is. Oh. Can I? You get an attack of opportunity as he's running away from you. Oh, like. I wanted to do this all night. I'm gonna shoot him in the back. <laughs> oh <my laughs> God. Go for it. The villagers all start to charge the temple and Matt pulls out two beautiful maps ready for combat next week. I'm excited to see this extremely chaotic fight go down and if they do manage to free the village from the throes of Vasselheim, what next? If we metagame this a little and we expect to have a similar length arc for this group as Team Wildmount, we know that they need to have roughly two weeks of adventure since Team Wildmount's trip to Malaysmir took quite a while. Are they gonna take on Vasselheim itself? Are they gonna try and teleport back to Dressal? Are. And what information do we think that they might learn about lewdness? Because I do really believe that they're probably going to find something useful about lewdness here since the other group did as well. You know, they're going to kind of combine their knowledge so that they can take him on at the next fight. As always, let me know your theories and predictions in the comments. And while we're waiting for next week, you should check out this video where I deep dive into the history and significance of the city of Whitestone. I honestly think it's one of my best videos. I'm so proud of it and I worked really hard on it. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. But until next time, bye.